Welcome to the Medspiration Podcast, where we discuss medical science and evidence-based tools for daily living. I'm your host, Dr. Nav, board-certified family medicine physician, and this is episode number 27 with Dr. Lorenzo Gonzalez and Dr. Dana Isaacs. Tomorrow, we're going public. That means that everyone at UIC is going to know that we're trying to form a union. Wait, we're the, we're the first in Illinois, the Midwest? Both, yeah. We know that when we file with the labor board that they will alert GME. It's gonna go from top to bottom all over the hospital. Oh, wow, okay. Yeah. Ah. It's surreal. I have one resolution I'm introducing today, which is in support of the Committee of Interns and Residents. To the doctors with the Committee of Interns and Residents. The interns, the residents, and the fellows. Honestly, when I got involved, I didn't really think about it as being as big of a deal as it's turned out to be. I was just like, oh, like I need to have more of a say as what into like what's happening to me and like an ability to advocate for myself. The culture of medicine can sort of keep you in its grips, and there's definitely a fear of retaliation. The practice of medicine has been a bit intense for residents. Working 14, 16 hour days. It's only average 80 hours a week. And we're doing it for our patients and we don't complain, but the conditions that we work in are the conditions that we serve patients in. Most academic hospitals patients go to. If the residents didn't show up a single day, the hospital wouldn't function. It would absolutely fall apart. With COVID, it's been like a whole other layer. If my hospital is this dependent on me, I should be able to have a say in the functions of this hospital, in the decisions of this hospital, in the direction of this hospital. Both the internal medicine and family medicine departments at SF General made hospital administration aware of an impending crisis based on staffing issues that were creating unsafe conditions with patient census increases. I'm calling on the University of California Board of Regents and the Office of the President to give the doctors in the university system the basic rights they deserve. I think one of the big milestones, at least for this past year, was starting the One UC campaign. Huge. All the UCs now have a bargaining table together at the UC table. Really? At UCLA, we've earned wage increases. At UCSF, we protected our health care. At New York Mount Sinai, we fought and we got an increase in our medical education fund. There's kind of this idea that medicine should be better, like we should treat each other better. And it's actually kind of heartwarming to see the commitment that my co-residents have. In my city and in other large hospitals around this country, resident doctors, young, young doctors, often with enormous student debt, have voted overwhelmingly to form unions because they don't want to work 80 hours a week for 60,000 a year. There's something really special happening in medicine right now, and it's given me a new hope that the future generations of doctors may just have the ingredients to innovate in healthcare. Our guests today are the national president and the Southern California regional vice president of CIR, also known as the Committee of Interns, Residents, and Fellows. CIR is the United States' largest and oldest labor union for doctors. I'm gonna have to be real with you. If you're in healthcare, especially if you're a med student or if you're in residency or fellowship, or if you're planning on going into healthcare, and even if you're just generally passionate about public or personal health, the next hour will be the most important conversation you will hear when it comes to the future of medicine. In this episode, we discuss the anatomy of CIR at a local, regional, and national level, how a union protects interns, residents, and fellows, how residents recently made history by giving notice to go on strike and successfully advocated not just for themselves, but also positively impacted the communities they work in. We discuss how you can start a union at your residency program, the ins and outs of collective bargaining, 
and how CIR's political and lobbying arms allow doctors to influence policy and legislation at the highest political levels. We even discussed the impacts of capitalism on healthcare and dissected current campaigns CIR is championing across the country. Timestamps are included in the description. Lorenzo and Dana left me speechless multiple times during this interview because like many other residents, I did not train at an institution that had formed a resident union, and I wasn't even aware of how it could help protect me and help me advocate for my patients. Many people don't know that CIR exists, and the more people that know, the more unions will have, and the more things will actually change. With this in mind, I ask you to please share this podcast with an intern, resident, or fellow in and outside of your own program. Share it with all the subspecialties. I don't care if you're IM, FM, surgery, radiology, or dermatology. Informing all the future physicians of what's at stake here is the first step towards creating real change. And this podcast episode literally contains all the information needed to put these changes in motion. Before we begin, I'd like to emphasize that this podcast is separate from my roles at UCLA. It is, however, a part of my desire to highlight how UCLA is one of the first places to work with CIR to help create better conditions for trainees and patients. Without further ado, let the medspiration begin. Lorenzo, yeah. Dana, welcome to the Medspiration Podcast. Thank you so much for joining us today. So I just want to start with brief introductions. We'll start with Dana. Can you tell us a little bit more about yourself? Yeah, I'm Dana Isaacs. So I am an internal medicine resident at a public institution currently. I have a master's in public health. So wow. super interested in both, you know, the individual level health and health at the population level. Um, I've done a lot of street medicine, you know, meeting folks where they're at to provide care, as well as working in federally qualified health centers as well. So I'm really committed to serving underserved and undocumented populations. And that's what brings me to medicine. That's awesome. I actually uh, trained at FQHC as well. That's awesome. Yeah, definitely. Um, Getting to serve that community is something that it's incredible. Lorenzo. Yeah. So uh, my name is Lorenzo Antonio Gonzalez. That's the way my dad pronounced it. And that's how I introduced myself. It's a joke for the folks that know me because they're always like, Lorenzo. (laughs) Um, I I, I hail from a small place called Anaheim, otherwise known as Disneyland. And um, yeah, I just like, I come from a story of immigration. I was, I have the privilege of being born here, but my parents come from Central Mexico, Jalisco and Michoacan. Uh, Academically, I would say uh, my roots start at... Cal State Dominguez Hills, which is local to California. Um, And then I had the opportunity to study medicine in UC San Diego. Uh, Fell in love with the border, fell in love with street medicine while I was at the border. Um, Part of that prime program allows you to get a master's in between the third and fourth year. Uh, And I had this crazy idea of getting a master's in urban planning Uh, And it really changed the way I viewed the world, essentially. Um, Other thing that I would say a little bit about me, a lot of my formative years were in a bookstore. I used to work for this bookstore called called La Libreria Martinez Books and Art Gallery in Santana, California. It was the largest Spanish book selling store in the United States. Uh, And... That's where I think I I got a lot of uh, my passion for helping folks through education, formal, informal education. And that's kind of how my view in medicine has been shaped. It's how do we empower folks? If it's education, let's get them education. If it's access to health care, let's get them access to health care. I decided to do my residency in Harbor UCLA, their family medicine program. I like to say it's the first um, safety net hospital north of the border. Wow. So you travel San Diego, you travel Orange County, and the first safety net hosp- true safety net hosp- hospital is Harbor UCLA. And what I does s- that mean? 
safety net hospital that we accept everyone um, regardless and we allow them to um, be connected with primary care specialists um, the whole array physical therapy mental health um, and you know we can talk about that at deeper lengths um, but what really brought me to county was that they were practicing uh, the closest thing I've ever seen to universal care in the United States that's incredible. And I needed to see it up close. So that brought me here. Same, man. Looks like we have a similar background. I, um, I was the first one to go into medicine in my family. Um, both my parents, they're from India. Mm. Um, they're both working class. Um, definitely had a lot of struggle just like going through the process and not having much guidance. Yeah. I actually just did a rotation at Harbor uh, last month, which honestly was one of the most diverse experiences I've ever had. So many different languages spoken there. Yeah. 33, 35 yeah. different languages. And honestly, that was the closest thing I had experienced to universal health care because we were getting people established. We were yeah. making sure that they're going to have follow up. Tying that together is a big piece to making sure that the continuity of care is where we want it to be. Tell us a little bit about CIR and your roles with it. Well, I think the easiest way to describe CIR is the largest uh, union of doctors in the nation. Um, so that, that, I think that in itself has a lot of value and it is c comprised of interns, uh, residents and fellows. Uh, we're roughly in about eight states. So we're a national union and we've been affiliated with SEIU for quite some time now. With SEIU, we have about 2 million strong, uh, which allows us to really, um, you know, use the collectiveness. Um, what is... S-E-I-U. I was kind of curious about that. Yeah. So this is another union um, with other locals that represent other workers. Uh, and the S-E-I-U is the what we consider our, the larger union with, made up of different locals. So CIR is affiliated under S-E-I-U, which means that in what we find are what we call our S-E-I-U family, uh, that SEIU family consists of nurses, folks that work at home, a wide variety, um, also janitors. Uh, and, and that's where I think a lot of our strength really comes. One of the biggest things I wanted to get out of this podcast, just to educate myself, was um, the different levels to the organization. Because you're the national president. Correct. You're the regional vice president. How can people distinguish those roles and like what they mean to the big picture? Yeah, so I can start an SCIU, just so folks know who don't, stands for Service Employees International Union. So basically the Committee of Interns and Residents, we are a part of a greater union across the country, which makes us a lot stronger. So I'm a regional vice president, meaning that I work with the other Southern California residents and fellows, um, the other vice presidents, and we work together on local initiatives. And then I'm also part of the National Executive Committee with Lorenzo, where we work on more national issues in terms of expanding CAR to other institutions. So I sort of get both the, the local level and the national level. And I just started my role, but I will be here for two years and I'm really excited. That's so cool. Uh, one of the things I noticed, so my, my residency program, we did not have a union. So um, the second I got here as a fellow, Actually, one of my co-fellows sent me an email and it was like, welcome to UCLA. You can join this union if you would like. And it kind of just listed off the things that the union has provided. You know, making this move to LA, one of the first things I noticed was the rent is astronomical. Yeah. Literally, it's extortionate. Yeah. Um, and I was so happy to see that the, the union here, they had already like put in enough work to make sure residents were getting stipends for living expenses. And then I got to sit in a couple of these meetings. I was like, oh my God, I've never been in a space where residents can just talk about anything and everything that's concerning to them and how we could make not just our experience better, but it's connected to patient care. I just, I can't even tell you how inspired I am by the work that's being done. One of the things I really have a question about is when it comes to the national level, what are the responsibilities there versus being in the kind of the regional level? And how does that kind of connect to, like I was at a bargaining meeting this week. How would people be able to connect those? Yeah, I, I can start off. And 
I think um, before we dive into that, I think one of the things that we need to highlight is that CIR is 85 staff members strong, right? So that means that for all the organizers you all are seeing at your day to day, there's more of those folks doing the exact same job throughout the nation. Additionally, we have folks that are dedicated uh, to what we call new organizing, making sure that uh, we're you know fielding questions from folks that are interested in unions. But we also have departments on communications. We have strategic campaigns, um, which look at what are the trends. Um, and then we also have a political department. And, and those things, I think, is what really makes a CIR special for residents is that when you interface with CIR at a local level, you see it as your organizer, maybe your regional director. Um, you have your leaders, your membership leaders, which are like Dana as a regional vice president. Um, but then there's so much more. And I didn't see that until I stepped into the national role. Uh, when I started to see the whole program flow chart of like, wow, these are all the folks that are really making residents' dreams come true, right? Like the whole point of it is like, what can you imagine to make this better? And we have folks that their sole job is to make that a reality. Yeah. Uh, and when that synergy happens, I think that's when we start seeing like the first time UCLA bargained, uh, which was about four years ago, where it made headline news. When LA County just bargain, finished bargaining, it was making headline national news. So we have to be able to say like when we think of CIR, we have to see the membership side, but also the staff support. Mm -hmm. Overall, just to go back into that structure, I think um, CIR is there's a, the, like the three officers, uh, national officers. It's the president. That's the role I'm currently have the privilege to serve. Uh, we have an executive vice president and then we have our secretary treasurer. Um, and both of those folks are actually based in New York and having that New York, California connection, I think oh, really wow. helps, uh, when framing issues, uh, cause we, that's the whole point of this. We're leaning on each other. Yeah. Um, and then the, the, I think the special part is the regional vice presidents. Um, and I always say that there is no national without the regional vice presidents because they are the ones that are bringing the membership issues from the local when we call shops, we're talking about hospitals. It's just how we talk about this. UCLA is a local, uh, UC San Francisco is a local. Um, they bring those issues and those inspirations and those experiences to the national. And that's where we have the collective thought of like, how do we move forward? Um, and, and so I think that's kind of the, that, that, national that doesn't get a lot of attention on a day-to-day -day. it's probably something that you haven't necessarily seen mm -hmm. uh, but a lot of the support that comes out of like well we need to support florida uh, because they're going into bargaining and this is what they need or we need to support ucla we need more folks when it came to my harbor ucla my area people brought we were able to mobilize folks for really immediate things wow. and i think that just really brought a lot more support and uh, and our goals were met mm -hmm. um so having that background having that so that 85 people i think is not necessarily seen but it's actually what really moves the needle wow that's yeah. cool that that kind of makes sense so it looks like the national level oversees the entire picture mm -hmm. and you get to do you communicate with like the regional vice presidents and they are like the liaison to be able to connect and then you know what resources to send. Is that kind of... Yeah, the only other a added part to this is the delegates. Because mm. um, the delegates are elected people that you work with day for day, right? That's what the, the, de the delegates, other people call them stewards, um, but they're the ones that are going to be your point in contact. In my view, I think delegates run the hospitals. Like mm. They're the ones that have the vote to say, this is the direction we want this hospital to go to. The regional vice president can be a delegate or they don't have to be a delegate. Mm -hmm. But that locality, I think what the regional vice president has the, the privilege to do is to oversee more than just one hospital. Oh. So in your case, you have UCLA, um, but you also, you know, UCI and UC San Diego, those are things that really matter. Um, and having that delegates really take that leadership, I think really allows you 
um, to see the micro, the macro, and then the really like high mountain view. Is Big the picture. National, yeah. Wow. Okay. So Dana, tell me about your experiences uh, with being regional vice president and what you wish to highlight in that role. Yeah. So I also serve as a delegate. Basically all of the delegates meet once a year and we share ideas, we pass policy, vote on resolutions, and it's a really important time to make connections and share ideas too. So that's also a really big role of CIR nationally is to facilitate those connections. And then I just started my role as the regional vice president, but essentially we're gonna meet in person four times a year and then virtually a little bit more often just to, again, you know, share ideas and make each other's programs stronger. So I will facilitate that over several different programs. So tell me, when did CIR start? Yeah, I mean, the, the date that we all have in mind is, I think, 1957. That's what Wikipedia That's says. That's exactly yeah. right. Founded in Found- New York City's public hospital. I mean, to me, that just means legacy. Mm-hmm. That, that means that there's, there's been time for development. Overall, uh, 1957, there was like a, a, a 10 year difference between when public organized and then private New York organized. Most of the things that, you know, when you start looking at the history of CIR, it's still very relevant to today. Like in the 80s, that's when they were fighting for making sure there was regulation of how many calls you have. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so this history of when did CIR start, I think, uh, 1957 in New York, but the expansion over, and there was other house staff, so like associations, there was already other unions around. Um, and it, the, just the growing sense of this movement uh, was slowly growing, but I would say like in the last six years is when everything really started to take off. That's what I noticed. I mean, what caught national news was the most recent thing where UCLA Harbor residents threatened to go on strike. And this was so big coming from a residency where we didn't have unions. I felt like it was too difficult to voice anything, you know? So when I was hearing about this, I was like, wait, residents are allowed to do that? Like, are they protected? Are they going to be able to still have a job in the future? These were real questions I had. How does a union protect residents? So we are protected in terms of speaking about our working conditions. So we are permitted to do that. I learned a lot about labor law. Yeah, and I'm so interested in learning about that. Is there a federal level, state level? I think the big thing that I learned was um, there is contention on are we students or are we trainees mm-hmm. or workers, right? Like th- I think that that first um, was something that Sierra had actually a really big part of back in, I think it was, I think it was the 90s or 80s. I forget the exact date, but um, where there's this, governing body i mean I, I knew nothing about this until i went into cir and even after three four years being in CIR, mm-hmm. that's a national labor relations board which um is a federal uh it's like a federal body that governs any contentious issues between employer and employee who has the right to organize doesn't have the right to organize um and a lot of what happens that may be protected or not protected gets actually decided by this board um, so what happens usually in just any type of like collective bargaining agreements is there is times where some people are unfair and you have to file unfair labor practices and these get sent to the NLRB or a similar body at a local uh, state Um, And depending on who's sitting on that board is really going to dictate the outcome. Um, And I think that's why interpretation is so important. Um, That was the the beginning when I was like, okay, if I'm going to, if we're going to do anything that's going to put our membership in, let's say, you know, in a decisive point where like it may go turn out well, may turn out wrong, we have to be protected. Mm -hmm. Um, So when you're talking about this um, strike uh, vote that we took and like we were really close to striking, um, it was under protected, uh, making sure that we were already talking to these governing boards 
and saying, these are the reasons why we feel the need uh, to strike. And that level of protection is actually pretty fluid um, and can change. And that was something that we as you know, regional vice presidents and local leaders from the hospitals and the bargaining table had to have communication with our legal team. Because uh, the last thing, the last thing that we want is for our residents to have any type of retaliation. Yeah, 100%. That, that, anything that would actually cost them opportunities in the future. Because we're a huge investment. Like society has invested in our education. We've invested in our education. Um, our success is paramount. Uh, so as we move forward, you know, what protects us? We have a, the, the laws throughout the, I would say, the last 100 years have been actually been more pro-employer than worker. Um, and, and that's really like one of the big ones is the Janus Act. Um, which really made it hard to organize, especially in public spaces, like pu public institutions. Uh, but there's always been, how do we remove the strengths from collective bargaining? How do we remove the strengths from union work? Uh, and and we, it makes us just be more creative. Mm. So, you know, from the strike point, I think um, the strike point really that was a national labor relations board or equivalent governing body that we had to make sure that we were checking off our boxes in order to be protected. Mm -hmm. and the thing that I would say is like, that is fluid. Uh, and, and that's, we had to keep reevaluating that um, pretty much on like a weekly basis. How does this exactly, do you guys give them a notice in advance? Like, are you saying, Hey, we're going on strike on these dates and, we're just not going to come to the hospital. So the way they did it, they yeah. gave 10 days advance notice. Okay. Since, you know, patient care is obviously the priority, making sure that we can find that coverage before taking this sort of action. So patient safety and, you know, finding that coverage is, is priority. Yeah, that's paramount. Where I trained, it was two specific hospitals. Those hospitals couldn't run without residents and fellows because we, we were there 24-7. Um, seven days a week, 365. So, I mean, in your guys' experience, was it kind of similar? So that's probably why, at least for Harbor and USC, they gave notice of the mm -hmm. strike, but they were able to reach an agreement for their contract before actually taking, you know, before actually undergoing the strike. That's incredible. So. I called in this week to the one of the bargaining meetings. I think it was Micah. He was like the biggest thing when you're when you're trying to negotiate is actually action. How long did it take to reach an agreement once that, that formal, hey, we might go on strike? Like, what, how long did it take? Yeah, I, that, that, was a, that was a tough time um, because I think we, we sent it out uh, and it took within three days of what we called intense bargaining. Mm. So it was definitely within a week that we wrapped it all up. And it, what intense bargaining is, is you keep going until someone says, I got to go to sleep. And I remember getting off shift, you know, making sure that my, I did all the patient care stuff, come home, uh, my fiance was cooking, uh, and I just jumped right onto a call. We just kept going until like two o'clock in the morning three o'clock in the morning and then we oh we then you know said we signed off um and we got up and we went to work and then we did it again and then we did it again and it was just going back and forth on trying to get the best deal possible and there was a definitely pressure from both sides we we knew what were the areas we were not going to concede in mm-hmm the pressure was like, nobody wanted to go to strike. Nobody goes into yeah. these things wanting to strike. Uh, we want the best contract possible and we want to be there for our patients. Mm -hmm. um, so there was, there was definitely pressure to try to avoid a strike as much as possible because we knew that our patients were not going to have us there. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's why we stayed up. And, and I think we, 
what we normally do is we bargain once a week okay. for about maybe two to three hours. When we made that declaration that we need to, um, that we needed to, that we were going to strike if we didn't get what we wanted, uh, everything accelerated. And that's when it became intense bargaining. And we were like, we're going to stay here until what time it needs to do. Was this the first time residents ever threatened to go on strike? At least in my memory. I think there was in the distant past yeah. of CIR, but not recently. Okay. So like 1957, things are founded. I've only been in medicine. I mean, if you count being a med student, like seven, eight years, you know? Yeah. But I had never, ever heard of anything like this. And I think what I'm synthesizing from what you're saying is, you know, I thought about, okay, I'm an overworked resident. Yeah. Um, I'm sleep deprived. My brain is like, it's functioning at a high level, but man, like it's really difficult to provide quality patient care yeah. um, when you're working that much. But I didn't have a union at my place and I didn't really feel like I had a space to talk about it because yeah. even the time that I had off, uh, you spend it sleeping or eating <laughs> or exercising because yeah. that's like all that's left. I always felt like if I went about it without a union there, like there might be repercussions. Mm -hmm. And I think what I'm synthesizing is uh, due to labor union laws that were protected by, like we're allowed to have a legal avenue to be able to speak up on these things. Correct. And I won't get fired. Yeah. Oh man, bro. That's big. That's big. Cause I never even knew that was a thing for residents yeah. and fellows. So what are some milestones CIR has had? I think one of the big milestones, at least for this past year, was starting the One UC campaign. Huge. So all the UCs now have a bargaining table together at the UC table. Really? Yeah. So very unprecedented, um, very, very powerful as well. So that was something we were really excited about. And um, we're also, you know, through the UCs being connected, able to roll out actions together as well. So it's a very powerful mechanism to unify on certain issues. That's really incredible. I grew up in California. UCs is universities of California. So what you're telling me is basically the entire state of California, all the UCs, um, all the residents at every UC, th there's a way that we all communicate and there's kind of a unified approach with that is that exactly yeah and each oh. institution sends their own delegates to the state table so if you want to be a delegate and you have a union you can either be at the local table so you said you're at ucla you could be at ucla's local table or the state table for all of the ucs and get to represent at more of a state level how do we get this in every state we're working on it we're at, uh, at 10 states yeah so far, Whoa. New York, New Jersey, D.C., Vermont, Florida, New Mexico, California, Illinois, Washington, and Massachusetts. I'm trying to understand what my first step would be to start this at my program. Would I email Dana? Or like, how, how would I just like, what's my first step in management with that? Nav, I can get you connected with your organizers for next steps. Okay, for sure. So... The CIR website actually has a link where programs who do not have a union can get connected and talk with CIR about establishing a chapter. So uh, for anyone listening to, that's what I would recommend as a first step. So let's say um, you were somewhere in Illinois um, and you wanted to you know, talk it up and see what's going on and mm -hmm. you know, bounce off some ideas. Uh, the easiest way and the way we like to track it is going through like our website and just sending us an email. Perfect. If you okay. want, if you want to um, go through our social media, we also will pick up those requests through that. Uh, if if you want to talk to us as like you know our we're f our actual faces, like somehow we're in a convention, right? We all went to the AMA House of Delegates, you know, like we're all there, and, and then we start talking about resident issues. Uh, we will take your contact information and pass it to our department of new organizing and, and they'll start yes. communicating. Okay. That's perfect. And that would work even if this is in a state where say there is no union in that state. Correct. So okay. you just go to the committee of interns and residents website and click on start a chapter at your institution. And then our staff members would get in touch with them about starting 
So at your institution level, you can become a delegate, meaning you're representing your institution and your department, you know, within your union. Um, there's usually as well a contract action team. So they work, you know, during bargaining to help plan actions and demonstrations and anything else that you want to do. There's also the regional leadership, regional vice presidents that, you know, work together with other regional VPs. Okay. Um, and then they're also a part of the greater national board too. So it just sort of depends on your interest and what kind of area you'd want to be involved in. Mm-hmm. Let's just like be idealistic and envision that all 50 states, all the residents, um, they joined. What do you think we could do if we were able to reach that type of capacity? Yeah, I mean, I think residency life could be so much different. And um, like my mentor, Mark Kelly, Dr. Mark Kelly said, being full participants in our life, you know, which is super wow. important. Mm. Being able to, you know, actually have hobbies outside of medicine, spend time with your family, whether that's your partner, your kids, your pets. Yeah. And that ultimately makes us much stronger doctors as well. And there is this massive wave of unionization and I wouldn't be surprised if we did spread to more states. Oh, I want everybody that's listening to this. If you're in a state or if you're at a residency program that does not have this, please reach out because it's, it's so powerful. Yeah, I was just going to add, you know, we really have the power to determine our work environment. You know, we don't have to work 80 hours a week and work every weekend and on call multiple days in a row. You know, we can come together and decide what we think is the, the best thing for us and our patients. Wow. So it's a big public health issue. And I'm really inspired and really proud to be a part of this. That's incredible. You know, I'm, I'm so grateful for residency in general because it did like, it shaped me to be able to practice medicine when yeah. I'm asleep, when I'm awake, even just coming out of residency, becoming board certified, I felt competent. So like, I'm really grateful for that. But there was so many times where I was so burnt out and I felt like it was almost it's almost too much. And being able to share a space with you guys and share a space with CIR and feeling safe enough to be able to voice those things. And I think you said something so important, altruism. They kind of feed off that altruism. Yeah. One of the things my wife and I were talking about is the residents that go above and beyond. And we all go above and beyond. Yeah. But like you're almost rewarded for going more above and more beyond at your own self-expense. It mind boggles me. Uh, right. Because everyone says, well, is this tradition, right? Like, just just put your head down, just suffer these three to four, maybe seven years, right? Depending on what, what a residency program you're going through. Um, but I, that, that type of logic just doesn't really make sense. And, and I always feel like tradition is just another word for archaic. Right. Um, and the system that we have in place, it just doesn't have our voices in the right spaces. Um, that's why I'm a very big advocate of what we call true participation. And this is directly from my urban planning days. It's like, how do we get the voices of the folks that are impacted into the decision-making process? Wow. Um, yeah, yeah. And, and residency doesn't allow that. I think what residency does is allows you to be a consultant. And I think we use that word all the time and very much so the consultant gets the question, um, they're able to provide information, but they shouldn't really be putting the orders, right? Yeah. They're, they're not the decision-making group. Um, and that level of consultation um, in outside of medicine, in where, you know, what your program direction is going to go, what hospital system is going to go, that to me is not the best form of participation. And what CIR does and what I think collective bargaining does is that it puts us into the decision-making. Yeah, We tell folks... Let's all come to a neutral table and let's talk about what our wants and our desires and how can we make that happen. And, 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 and that's, I think, the power of a union. When you have over thousands of people behind you where you crafted language where everyone says, this is what we're fighting for. This mm -hmm. is what will make our day to day life better. That is when you're actually having true participation because Micah's on one side, right? Mm -hmm. You have your organizers on one side, and then you have the administration on the other side. Mm -hmm. and, and when you can actually have frank conversations about why. Why does this matter to us? Yeah. For me, the vision is, how do we have these kind of conversations with 
the specialty the specialty boards because a lot of the issues that we're having especially when we saw in the pandemic was uh, there's only a certain amount of time that you can have time off yeah and and if you exceed these times off then you have to talk to your program director that they appeal it that hopefully some board is going to say yeah you know this was actually a life issue and and you can still be uh, specialized. I think CAR is setting a really good example for all physicians in terms of having physician voices lead and you know, also impact public health policy issues, really things that are all related to the practice of medicine. And I think that's really important for our broader field of medicine as well. That's so important. And when it comes to negotiation skills, like where, where do you guys learn to negotiate? Because that's not something I was taught how to do. So we do have a legal team and we receive a lot of guidance from them. But that's good. I mean, none of us came in with a bargaining experience. At least, you know, I didn't. I've been learning along the way. And I think that's totally fine as well. We welcome those that may have experience, but also we're happy to mentor and, and teach folks along the way too. And um, yeah, it's just been really a, a learning experience and we do have the staff members to promote that. I would add that um, it's a team. You know, we're, we're all good at something mm-hmm. and, and it could be at the negotiation table. It could be at a rally. It could be at an op-ed. Uh, we all have lives prior to this. Like this medicine's a journey and we've, we've had to get here um, and we want to be able to utilize those experiences. So for me... You know, just being able to, to like talk about what does it look like to have true participation because I spent so much time in my master's program talking about how do we get the voices of the unheard to be heard. Yeah. Um, I, I felt that I was able to really use that in the bargaining table. There are some folks that have been on debate teams for a very long time and their ability to be able to speak decisively on a moment's notice is incredibly important. And I think that's where like having a good organizer Uh really comes in because having that good organizer identifies those throughout the year and says, all right, we need you at the bargaining table. So organizers are CIR staff and not resident physicians. So we're able to work together since, you know. That's good. Yeah, exactly. Since our schedules are pretty limited as right. interns, residents, and fellows. So, you know, we're already putting in a lot of time, but we are really helped by having them as well to work with them. Okay, that's reassuring. So it's not like I have to be the one coming up and negotiating and be the expert. We find the people who are good at that. And having a legal team, yeah, that's that's so cool. Just having a lawyer to ask questions to. And a negotiator. Yeah. So on the table, there's someone who says, you know, I've dedicated my life to negotiating just the same way you want a cardiologist uh, to be the one that's dealing with the heart, right? Um, There's folks that have dedicated their lives to um, economics and we need that person to really understand how the numbers are happening for this uh, healthcare system that is telling us they cannot afford a raise, right? Mm -hmm. Um, There's folks that really know how to make people move and that's our our public communications team. Uh, And and that's why I think having um, CIR is so important is because when when you feel that it's only your one or two organizer, it's because they're probably doing a really good job and they didn't really need to bring the whole team out. But mm-hmm. the team is there. And, and I think we saw it because all those op-eds that came out through the L.A. County um, bargaining, um, that had multiple layers of people to making sure that the right message, mm. the resident message was coming out. You know, this is all resident driven. All of the proposals for contracts, the ideas for CIR, everything's coming from residents and supported by staff. So truly a resident run, resident led organization. For the audience out there, one of the advantages I've had of joining the union, there's a thousand dollar stipend for a living expense on top of our salaries. There's like a three, and correct me if I'm, I'm missing the numbers, um, like a $300 Uber Eats fund. What else is there? What else have you guys been able to negotiate for residents? So at least your institution, UCLA, Mm -hmm. they have four weeks of paid family leave. And before that, it was only two. And we're actually working on negotiating that issue currently as well. 
paid family leave, paid maternity leave. We've all kind of learned about the neurodevelopment of children and how important it is for children to be around their caregivers and how that benefits the growing brain of a baby. And I think even non-medical professionals, it just it makes intuitive sense. One of the biggest, biggest challenges I felt like as a resident, it had nothing to do with me. It had to do with my co-residents who were women who had children. I did not feel like they were treated fairly through that process. What can we do to be able to help in the negotiation area for that? Right. Yeah. So this is a really important topic for all the UCs and their upcoming residency and fellowship contracts that they're working on. So every UC is currently working on trying to expand that family leave. Um, a lot of folks have to use, you know, vacation days, yeah. you know, as, as time off, which is really, really challenging, um, especially for, you know, a C-section, for instance. So you need, you know, at minimum 12 weeks off since that's a surgery and four weeks is not going to cut it if you did have to undergo that. Mm -hmm. So that's just one example, but really four weeks is not enough. Yeah, I think the big highlight is that every contract, this is an issue. Um, and making sure that right now we, we're looking at UCLA to continue to bring that up and elevate that up. So so as what that's the beauty of like looking at our other like different hospitals and being like, we want that language. It was given to them. Now we want it here. Mm. Um, so I think a lot of this is one at the bargaining table, but that really also pushes the thing of like, should this be done via a political campaign? Right? Mm. Do we need to change the California laws right. in order to figure this out? And, and also that is very much resident led. We focus on the things that residents really care about. And I think what I've been hearing a lot more recently is like, what about covering for in vitro fertilization, mm. right? Making sure like if we're going to dedicate ourselves um, to this training for so long, then we have to be able to have a mechanism that when we want to have a family that we have access to that. Mm -hmm. and, and that is now much more of a forefront than I would say the first time that we bargained a contract. So even though we see it happening on a, on a contract to contract, it might be that our next go around that we do it at a legislation level. Yeah. I also want to bring it back to the like the specialty boards in this regard because I think the specialty boards uh, uh, there's a miscommunication of what happens when someone has a child and the extra month that they have to use vacation time for yeah. uh, in order to be able to cover and I think that's just not okay um, and, and and those communications I think that's where our union needs to really step into mm -hmm. uh, to be able to say these are the issues uh, we need to relax some of these like how strict you all are about making sure who can sit on for the boards, who is actually going to be board certified, uh, because it's really putting a lot of pressure on our residents. I think that's the new territory going forward. Definitely. I felt like graduating, um, like for my, my co-residents that had children and some of them who had more than one child, it became very difficult where you could use all your vacation up for the first child, but what happens when the second child's coming around and you don't have any time off? I felt like the biggest resident struggle there is like, all right, well, I did four years of college, four years of med school. I have so much debt right now. Um, I need to make sure that I get through my residency training so that one day I can pay back all this debt that I've acquired. And But then it becomes so challenging when it's like, you don't have enough time and you're being faced with a situation where you might not be able to graduate your residency training um, because you had a child. Exactly. Yeah, you shouldn't have to put your life on hold to start a family if that's what you want to do. And, you know, that's what we're advocating for. And childcare, equally important as well. You know, thousands of dollars a month that we do not have. And if you're, you know, the solo provider for your dependent, then how are you going to pay for that when you're working 80 hours a week? That's so that's another one. layer of complexity. One of my co-residents um, traveled from the valley to the Bay Area, down South Bay Area, um, because childcare was so expensive. And that's where they were able to connect with family. And, you know, that having family is a privilege as well. Yes. That's able to um, provide care. Uh, but that distance... That, that 405, like doing that freeway every day for three years, that, that is unacceptable. And, totally. and I think that's where childcare is as the other side of this coin is like, these are these new frontiers 
that we're putting and we're fighting for in our contracts to make sure that everyone comes out winning. And that, that can be expensive. I had yeah. a, a fellow, a co-fellow who had three children and was spending at least three to $4,000 a month on, on childcare alone. And where I did residency, there was only like two different places that you could have childcare. So they were backed up by like a year. So, you know, there's, there's some residents who moved out there. They didn't even know that they had to be on a wait list for like a couple of years before they could get some care, you know? And that's where, like you said, it's a privilege to have family around, but not everybody has that. You know, if, if you enjoy and you're happy, you do better work. Yeah. And, and, and making sure that folks are rested, folks are feel secured, and then they can really give their heart and soul to our patient population. And, and it's an investment in the future where, you know, one of the biggest things I wish and I want to be able to help try and contribute to the change is if we're talking about winning as a country, we have to invest into the future generations. And the more time the future generations get with their family, the better brain development they'll have, you know, and that's something that if it doesn't start in medicine, like where else is it going to start? And it ultimately makes us better doctors, you know, fully participating in our lives, being there with our family. It's really important and you can't just go to work and come back home every day for three, five, six years and work 80 hours a week and be a robot. You know, you, you have to be a person too and have a life outside. I definitely agree. Big loaded question. How do you guys feel like the impact of capitalism in healthcare has been? I remember um, you know, researching one of the presidents of Uruguay. Uh, his name was Jose Mujica. And he was talking about how uh, when you buy something, you, you don't buy it with money. You buy it with time spent to earn that money. Mm. And, and in other words, life, right? There's a portion of life that you give up. And in my view, um, capitalism is a way to kind of harness or be able to magnify that, that resource. Uh, but someone is giving up that moment of life, right? When, when we're thinking about uh, commodifications of items, and we're really thinking about is someone was toiling the soil, uh, somebody was working on that factory in order for that item to be produced, and, and that is time of life. I think, you know, healthcare has really looked at how we can exploit that aspect of it. How can we take care of the most exploited people? and be able to make money out of this process. And I think what we come, well, at least I'll speak to my, for myself, is I didn't join healthcare because of that. I didn't become a doctor to always just try to give someone who is working a day-to-day -day life of always like a worker, a little bit more life. I wanted to prevent these things. I wanted people to self-actualize. I wanted people to live the life they want to live, not because they're constrained by certain rent, uh, certain needs. Um, and, and, and that to me is what really took me into medicine. What I learned in my residency, and obviously it's a safety net hospital, mm -hmm. right? Is that what I was fighting as a primary care physician was I was fighting poverty. That if I really wanted to make a difference in people's lives, yeah. I needed to get them a job. Yeah. And my most successful time in residency was when I found someone housing. Wow. Because at that point, we were then able to talk about diabetes. We were then able to talk about hypertension. We were then able to talk about her osteoporosis. It wasn't until we stabilized what people would like to call the social, right, mm -hmm. that we were actually able to engage. And I think the, the, the part that people miss in this is that this is the reality of life of a lot of folks. And we're building these structures, these research, based on how to fix the downstream, but we all kind of see the upstream. Yeah. So I think that's how this game of like, how do we use people to create resources and then be able to create a system that is able to profit out of the same people that were being used to create those resources? Yeah, and I think capitalism doesn't necessarily lead to the best care, going off of what Lorenzo was saying. 
Same. I think that, you know, and it's integral to our mission and CAR's mission that healthcare is a right and not a privilege and our current system sees it as a privilege. So, you know, yeah. that is integral to our mission and, and something broader that we are very committed to, you know, as doctors and as CAR as an organization itself. I'm so passionate about that. You know, there's so much I learned actually training in medicine that I didn't know previous to. One of the things being what basic human rights are, you know, being a family medicine doctor training at a FQHC, a lot of the, the chronic diseases, we can't just look at the disease and treat the disease. Like when we look at individuals as a whole, you have to look at what environment they're in. But that's where things like a living wage comes into the equation. Absolutely. You know, and that's that's where things like access to health care for all people, they've already shown that the more people have access to health care, the better the health care outcomes. I wish we didn't have to even discuss that and we just knew that that was the case. But again, these are systematic issues or systemic issues that I can't provide the proper care until those things are taken care of. And I guess CIR, what's cool is like, we can advocate on that side of things, right? And how do we get involved politically if we are passionate about that? Like, what are the steps in that? Yeah, so CIR has a political arm and a lobbying arm. So thank you. Guys. <laughs> thank you. at your institution, you can get involved with the political aspect of CIR. And, you know, we've done lobby days. Um, it's really kind of whatever we want to do, honestly. It's sort of up to us. Yeah, and this is relatively new. I think we really accelerated in this direction um, around five years ago is when this be really became a, a thought of like, we need what we call a COPE, a Committee of Political Education. Uh, we need to be able to have some leverage. And, and it's really f interesting. Um, first, I would say, I don't even use pol the word politics anymore because Good. it has such okay. a negative connotation. Yeah. I like to say value advocating uh, because that's essentially what it is. It's just folks sitting around advocating for their own values. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we people are more inclined to be able to do that. Um, and w once you, you start seeing who's actually donating, who's lobbying, like who are the folks that are know that this works? Mm -hmm. It's everyone you expect, right? It's the large organized medicine, uh, you have the large pharmaceutical companies. Uh, you have other labor as well. Um, it's quite interesting when you look at the breakdown of like who donates the most mm. um, versus uh, who donates the least. The people that donate the most are folks that actually have a lot of skin in the game. The folks that are making probably close to minimum wage as possible. So when you look at how, why are we not involved in this situation? Mm -hmm. I think a lot of it comes to, we felt that politics was not, our arena. This was not affecting us. Um, gladly, medical school is now incorporating curriculums. And it, I think there's like a structural competency now at UCLA mm. that's relatively new, uh, where all the first year medical students are understanding what is structural racism, um, how are, you know, how is social justice and medicine, how do these things combine? If I had to put it in a sentence, I like to say that, you know, disease is the manifestation of oppression. Uh, and in order to be a good doctor, you have to be able to engage in what is it? What is oppression? Yeah. Uh, what how do you change oppressive forces? Because uh, that's really what hap that's diabetes. Yeah. Diabetes doesn't just happen. Right. Like uh, that's you're talking about hypertension doesn't doesn't just happen. These things are additive. These are living in experiences that have your cortisol levels extremely high. And then the end result is usually where we see them. Yeah. No, uh, that's a fact. It's evidence-based, yeah. too, because now they have enough studies to show that microaggressions for uh, minorities, how that affects hypertension in the long run and how African-American boys can develop hypertension as early as eight years old. And they've linked that to racism, which... Yeah. I think is so important as providers for us to understand, like there's a lot of uh, things that come into play with chronic disease that don't have to do with just like, you know, addressing that issue once it arises. It's, exactly. it, there's a lot of systemic things at play that we have to be able to address if we want better healthcare outcomes. 
yeah, I think, you know, now we're all being taught the social determinants of health and curriculum for med school and residency, but really this is medicine. Yeah. And, you know, some, there's still some distinction in some curricula, but it really truly is day in and day out our job to address these. Well, I'm so glad these conversations are being had and that you guys can perceive it that way. And that, you know, there's an avenue where I feel like I can do something about it because that was one of the biggest challenges being a resident and kind of seeing that there's so many social issues that play a role, even childhood trauma, you know, having a stable home environment, the ACEs study, it, it shows people if they have more than six or seven ACEs, they die 20 years before someone who hasn't Mm -hmm. dealt with those things. And if we're dealing with chronic disease at 50, 60, 70, 80 years old, how can we adjust what's going to happen for the future generations to improve not just the treatment of chronic disease, but the prevention of that chronic disease? And I think this is a great segue to what we call um, bargaining for the common good. Mm. Uh, So a lot of the, what makes me excited about CIR, what really has me like, yes, I want to continue to be a part of this organization is that legislation's hard to pass. Yeah. Um, and we've had good success. We've also had some failures. But what is sometimes faster is contracts and being able to not only advocate for yourself, but in that same vein, advocate for a win that also impacts the community. Mm. That, is, that, that is what we're really trying to be about. Uh, it's called a bargaining for the common good. And I think uh, one of the things that we were really passionate about at LA County was uh, being able to get a diversity fund and being oh. able to get a diversity curriculum um, in order in black and white in our contract uh, to making sure that it happens and we can have some sort of leverage if we feel like it's not happening. Um, And it was a great win. Um, It's public knowledge that we got $125,000 that's resident controlled in order to make sure that we are diversifying our medicine in general. Uh, And and that, you know, the the partnership, all of that happens, but we need to demand the things that we feel that are necessary. And the diversity is one spot. Yeah. Yeah. That is stemming from what we have with something called the patient care trust fund, meaning there's some things that we obviously feel like we need in order to get items into a hospital. That's incredibly hard. Mm -hmm. Um, So CIR really put it into their contracts that we need to have a separate fund that is controlled by residents only. Um, So if we want to do some incubators, right? And incubators as a sense, like let's have an idea, let's do a test pilot uh, and see how it goes then we have the funds to be able to do that. A lot of the things that we were bought um, and used in our hospitals are based off resident funds that are being used for this patient care trust fund. I didn't even know about this. The other one is our QI funds, which um, it's a great way to uh, really test out other ideas, right? So if if a resident has, you know, an idea of, you know, maybe we should text the people that are waiting in the emergency room um, but it's going to cost amount of money, then we should fund it. And, and, and I think none of this is actually coming from membership dues, but their contract wins. Mm. So when residents were thinking about, you know, we really care about research and improving our hospitals, CIR went out and said, all right, we'll get a quality improvement fund. When residents were saying, you know, our, our, our patients need better EKGs, they need better pathology equipment, um, CIR said, all right, we're going to go and get this patient care trust fund. Now we're seeing that we really need to fix this diversity problem. Mm -hmm. Um, The amount of diversity in medicine uh, cannot just be stalled. And we really need to address it. And one of the ways we're going to address it is making sure that conversations lead to something. And that leading to something is let's put it in our contract. Mm -hmm. So it's exciting to see these next two years to see how we're able to partner with L.A. County to see how we're able to partner with the health and the, the hospitals in LA County to develop a curriculum to support the diverse residents that are there already and to be able to utilize this new fund in a way that residents know. Because if you're going to recruit a resident, who's better to know that than another resident? Dude, yeah, that's got me med-spired, man. Yeah. Like, I, I did not know, but that makes me feel like we can innovate in the space, you know, yeah. and that there's an organized way to do that. And it's something we need to expand. Yeah. Not every contract has that. 
Yeah, and the ones that do, you know, set a great example for what is possible exactly. and what other institutions can do. I feel like they're setting that precedent, you know, um, and I'm so grateful to be a part of that. Being from a different state, I didn't even know these were things that were happening on a resident level. And for anybody in any state who is a resident going through that, like if it's possible here, it's going to be possible there. And I can add to you a little bit about the advocacy arm at CAR. Please. So, I mean, it is pretty new, but basically, you know, we can co-sponsor, sponsor bills, support bills, kind of do whatever residents really want and are engaged in. So over the last uh, year, I don't know if you heard about the physician training license. So we co-sponsored, it's a SB 806 in California, which essentially removes it. So it allows uh, folks to you know, volunteer, work in the settings that they want to, to be able to be a part of their communities. And before there was a restriction where you weren't able to. With Whoa. that restricted license. How long did that take to be able to change? They're working on implementing it now, so I don't have all the details, but it's pretty exciting. And, you know, the fact that there were residents, you know, Dr. Anna Yap was a resident in our union who really helped push that forward. And I think that's really amazing and inspiring. The way I, I summarize uh, the PTL was someone thought of a good idea, but didn't really check the people that were going to use the PTLs. And what we realized, it was a bigger headache. I mean, there's a role for the, the ideas behind it, but the implementation uh, really was devastating in, in many ways. One, personal finances, right? A lot of folks moonlighted and then yeah. a lot of folks gave access to communities that didn't don't have doctors because they were able to, you know, practice in areas and PTLs uh, didn't allow them. The system wasn't ready for the PTL. Mm -hmm. uh, so once CIR figured that out, we partnered up with other organizations and we made sure uh, that people knew and we sponsored the bill. Uh, we were one of the main people to make sure that PTLs were removed. My residency training started in 2019. Uh, we got hit by a pandemic. How do you think the pandemic highlighted some of the issues in, in healthcare? I think the pandemic pretty much exacerbated all the underlying issues that were already there. You know, doctors, nurses, other healthcare workers were already burned out. Mm. Pandemic just made all that worse, especially for doctors. You know, I would say a quarter, and I'm sure not for you too, maybe a third of my day is administrative work. So yeah. charting, prior authorizations, billing, calling pharmacies, calling insurance companies. And, you know, that's not why we chose medicine. We really want to be there with patients. We don't want to be on the phone with insurance companies. Mm -hmm. So I really think the, the pandemic added this other layer and a layer of stress that really exacerbated all the underlying issues. For sure. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of um, trauma that I experienced during the pandemic. Uh, there's things that I'll never forget. Um, hearing people pray through an iPad, um, was horrific um i remember those first couple of months yeah right in the beginning of march i was one of the seniors in the icu and we didn't know what was what was coming after you know that was one of the big i don't think anybody knew and, and i think that's the part where car got a lot of traction was because obviously we're good at organizing that's what that's our bread and butter mm -hmm. uh here was a moment where there was chaos. Uh, there was a lot of knowledge that people had and wasn't really disseminated properly. And that aspect, I think, really rallied a lot of folks to want to know answers. And when the answers that were being told weren't suffice, uh, we wanted to be a part of the resolution. Mm -hmm. We're solvers. We're problem solvers. Yeah, we're, absolutely. we're very intelligent people uh, who have dedicated their lives to this. We're the front, the front line. We want to be able to share with y'all what we have. Um, and that aspect of like, how are these guidelines being made? Yeah. Who were being put into these committees that were now making monumental decisions on our behalf? We're not even, just not even knowing what is going to happen next week put a lot of stress on our residents and, and that was where sierra said hey you want to change this mm. 
then we need to come together Mm -hmm. because individually it's going to be a lot harder. Exactly. And and that, that, I think that was the major change from a pandemic resident specific. Obviously, I mean, so many people died, right? Yeah. So many people that were already vulnerable populations really suffered. Uh, and, And we wanted to make sure that we were able to be there in front lines to be able to then take care of our patients. But the only way we were able to gonna be able to do that effectively is if we knew our schedule. <laughs> if we knew what we were doing. Yeah. If we had the right equipment. And sometimes at that time, I think the whole world didn't have the right equipment. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think those levels of transparency is really what I, what I always go back to. What is true participation? Mm-hmm. Right? Were mm-hmm. we just being told what were we going to do? Or were we part of the conversation about how are we going to do this next? I think we earn the right to be there. Yeah, Lorenzo, thank you so much for sharing that. Lorenzo, really, and, and you too, Nav, you were in the heart of the pandemic really the entire time. So I worked, you know, one year in. Mm-hmm. Um, but even then I can speak, you know, on behalf of myself that and my class that we're still recovering from that. And, you know, calling someone's family member, like their wife, their husband, their partner, their brother, their sister, whomever, and telling them that they've passed is the worst thing that I've ever had to do. And, you know, especially something preventable. This is a public health issue. And, you know, I think the data show, too, that doctors are more burned out than ever right now. Yeah, yeah there was a study in the Mayo Clinic proceedings that estimated one in five doctors are likely to leave medicine in the next two years and that's pretty scary just given that we already have a really significant physician shortage so just taking that into account i yeah pretty scary for our country very very scary and you know i definitely agree there's a lot of ptsd um from experiencing the pandemic not knowing our schedules also not having a say in what was going to happen but then being expected to be at three places at once yeah i think the shortages in the hospitals, um, even nursing shortages, and how that exacerbated burnout, even at the highest level of the highest performing professionals. It's been so difficult watching that process. But then in addition to that, I really felt like there wasn't anybody or anything I could reach out to. There were so many times I just I kind of felt hopeless and I just had to keep going. I think all of this kind of points back to the reason why if we all unionize, if we all have a collective group in which we could speak, I think one thing I know for sure of any resident in the United States of America is we came into medicine because we had an intention to help people, exactly. you know, and we get introduced to so many different problems or issues that have nothing to do with just patient care. And it's so important to branch out and actually address those things too. The well, last thing I want to highlight on this is um, how we were almost shamed for hazard pay. Yeah. In the sense of like, how dare you all ask for financial compensation for trying to be the frontline physicians? Yeah. Right? And, and that was, I think that took us like a year. And I think a lot of folks are still fighting. Yep. So in, in New York, it was just recently included that residents were going to be a part of their own. Uh, what you know, Everyone has different names. We called it impact pay. Some folks call it hazard pay, recognition pay, mm-hmm. uh, some sort of financial contribution. And the part that I think um, is really interesting to me is I felt that there was no way that I was able to kind of gain the education that I missed. Right? Yeah. We all stopped. Everybody stopped. Um, I wasn't able to go on my street medicine elective. I wasn't able to do incarceration medicine, things that brought me to my program, Mm. right? Things that I'll never be able to do when I was supposed to do them. The only way that I've discovered that in in this country, you feel appreciated, the universal way, is a form of financial compensation. Mm -hmm. So we were looking for the respect and dignity that we deserved for the work that we did and we did it selflessly. But in this country, in these contracts, the way to be able to get that is through some sort of compensation. You got to have it. You know, it's uh, also related to public health. So some folks are taking care of sick family members or they have kids. 
So, you know, if they were to get COVID, it's not, it's not just impacting them. It's now impacting their community and broader than that. So I think the recognition pay even goes beyond that, just a sacrifice that we made for our families and our yeah. other loved ones. Definitely. That does transition me into a question, a very personal question. What was the hardest experience that you had in residency slash what is the hardest experience that you have had while going through training? There's always in my mind this pre-pandemic or post-pandemic? <laughs> <laughs> is, this, is this before that? I grew up in an area, in a, in a family that we weren't really showing emotion too much. So, mm. you know, seeing, um, I was, I was my, my father figure, my dad, um, very stoic person. Mm -hmm. um, and I think I embodied that. But during intern year, I remember just breaking down. And it was um, in, the, in the CCU. And it just felt that we were understaffed. It always felt that we were one person too short. We were doing really quick turnaround 28s. Uh, and, and I just, I was exhausted. I was just physically and mentally exhausted. Uh, and I just felt, I felt that I wasn't doing the job at my highest caliber. That was probably pre-pandemic when I said I lost all love during that moment mm. to medicine. And, and, and saying that out loud has taken a lot of time for me of reflecting that this experience, this calling that we've been able to do is also very damaging and very uh, selfish. Mm -hmm. and, and I had to commit everything. I, you know, my family came, everything came second. Um, and I think during that CCU um, rotation, it was just so... I just felt so overworked um, that my body just was shutting down. Yeah, thanks for sharing, Lorenzo. That's really tough, and we appreciate you being vulnerable with us. Thank you. There's been so many hard days in residency. It's honestly hard to pick one. Yeah. Um, but for me, I'm personally very interested in cancer and end-of-life care, so I find a lot of fulfillment in that. And when I was on the oncology unit, I had a patient with metastatic cancer who, you know, had a new low and only maybe one to two weeks to live at this point. And before that thought that they, you know, had at least another 15 years of, of good life to have. And, you know, I spent a lot of time enrolling her in hospice, um, contacting her son to, you know, give the agency the keys to her house and be in communication with them. And the son was on board, um, but then, the son stopped responding to the calls. So hospice tried to call and no response and weren't able to get a hold of him. So um, the patient ultimately ended up passing in the hospital when she had expressed to me fully that she wanted to pass at home alongside her dogs and her family. And I think that was one of the hardest things to, to go through because I just felt, you know, alongside the nurse and alongside my co-resident and the hospice nurse, we just felt so powerless in that situation. We knew the patient's goals and wishes and we weren't able to fulfill those. So I, that was the hardest day that I've had. I hear that. I just want to acknowledge you both for, you know, sharing those vulnerable moments. Uh, Lorenzo I also had a, a moment where it was so difficult for me to put into words. Am I losing my love? for what I'm doing. And there were so many situations where I, I did feel that way and it was so difficult for me to even, like I put that off. And then dealing with dying patients, the stress of holding space for families and that's secondary trauma. I didn't have a space to be able to address the secondary trauma either. Like you don't usually have enough time to reflect on, wow, that was a really stressful conversation that we had. and. You know, that actually affects how I feel as well. It doesn't have to be that way. Yeah. And, and I think that's where I, I think CIR is the vehicle for folks to feel protected and, be, and say, you know, what are the alternatives? Because we're willing to work on trying to find alternatives to this. That's just not sustainable. This idea of just, just work through it. It's only three years. Yeah. It's, it's just not the answer. Yeah. Life outside of medicine is really important uh, for, you know, being a person, mitigating burnout, finding meaning in medicine. For me, same with Lorenzo, I, I really am passionate about street medicine. 
and I went to a street medicine conference on my day off from CCU, you know, the cardiac unit. And while I loved being there, it just, it was exhausting. Like I didn't have time for my passions and, and hobbies in, in that 80 hour work week. Mm -hmm. So I agree with you. I think CIR is, you know, a mechanism to get here. Residents and fellows can have a life outside of medicine. On a lighter note, what's the, the best day in residency you guys experienced? I can give a, a non-clinical instance oh, for residency. I think, um, I don't know if every Nav does your program do a retreat. Did you yeah. do an internal medicine retreat? I don't know if you did yeah, too, did. Lorenzo, but I felt like that was a really special space, especially after, you know, or amidst the pandemic where we had a three days that we were able to, to be together and our program's really large. So, you know, at least 50 in each class. So it was a time that we wow. were all off at the same time, which never happens. Um, you know, we got coverage from attendings and we're able to spend that time together in Indian Wells. Um, we had some, you know, meetings and um, curricula as well, but it was really nice to have, to have that space because I hadn't had that before. Wow. I think for me, um, obviously when we like ratified our contract, yay, hey. yay, that's great. Um, but if I'm going to be honest with you all, the, the story I told earlier about that patient that we were able to get housing, uh, I mean, we try to get housing for so many people. And this was someone that was my continuity patient. I would say that's my medical best because I remember celebrating with her and saying goodbye to her when I was finishing my chief year it was really heartbreaking. It was really hard to say because they were like, well, where are you going next? Can I follow you there? And it was just like, it'd be great. But I, that's, I can't do that. That's ethically not right. Mm -hmm. Um, but I, what tops that was graduation when um, I was board certified and I was able to, it was, it was just enough after the heights of the pandemic where we were going to have an in-person graduation. Oh, wow. Yeah. And they said, you can only bring three people. And I brought my fiance, my mom and my aunt, which is my second mom. And they saw me wear the white coat as a full-fledged board-certified physician. That, to me, was the whole point of this. Yeah. The whole journey of all of this. And, and, and I wish my dad was there. He passed early in the pandemic. Um, but being able to, to see my family look at me as a working physician was probably brought me the greatest joy to this day. Uh, probably what's going to top this is my marriage, which is happening in like a month. But. God bless you. Man. Congratulations. <laughs> yeah. Congratulations. That's so beautiful. And you actually like, that's definitely one of my best moments was graduating as well. Um, having your family there, yeah. feeling seen by them, you know, feeling heard by them, having people that you worked with, your attendings um, speak about you, exactly. you know, reflect on like what, we did and how we contributed to a community to make it a better place. Um, definitely hands down, just being able to sit down with my mom and sister and just reflect on that. That was incredible. Um, uh, the medical side of things, I'll never forget uh, continuity patient. And you know, one of the coolest things about family medicine, we usually have like, we're, we're PCPs for like the whole family. Right. So, you know, there's a couple uh, and their kids and I was that was their PCP. I had the privilege of being that the the oldest male individual in that family. He had so many chronic conditions. He was going to pass my first time setting up home hospice uh, in the outpatient setting. Cause you know, I, I felt like it's, we do it in the inpatient setting all the time, but you know, being able to see that from like six months to nine months in advance and like setting it up and then it happening and then being with the family after it had happened and literally like a visit just based on debriefing with each other, you know, and just being like, how, how are you taking it? Just being able to hold that space that I've, I've never forget that moment. One of the reasons I went to geriatrics was this reason where that, that end of life care, it's such a, such a sensitive time. And we're so privileged as providers to be able to, to help make that transition, even if it's 1% easier on families. Like we are so privileged to do that. That's why we're here. Yeah. I would say, you know, for the folks out there that are, look at CAR, um, you know, a union is, is as strong as what you make it. And, and if, if you have negative connotations on what unions were in the past, 
uh, I think it's important to understand that this union is made up of us. This is our union. It's not my union. It's no one's union. It's all of our union. And unless you engage, uh, we're not going to hear your voice. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that's something that's incredibly important. The other aspect of that is we don't want you to come to the union. We really want the union to come to you. Meaning we want that we want the union to empower what you're already doing. If you are about research, let us help you do your research. If you are about public health, let us create a forum for that public health. If you are about um, you know, QI, let us develop a QI fund. We want the union to come to you. We know that there's a lot of people uh, that bargaining, contract, language, that's not their jam. Uh, but that's that's not what only a union does. Mm -hmm. A union should be a collective with resources where we're able to get the things we want to get done. And I think that's what we have. And, and I think that's why it's catching on in so many places, not only because, uh, you know, there's terrible working conditions, because there are terrible working conditions, but we are giving a platform for folks to really say, my issues matter and we deserve more. Uh, one of the things we love to end this podcast with is having you guys share with us the greatest piece of advice that you've gotten uh, to this point. Do you want me to start? Yeah, please. Uh, this is tough, but I feel like the best piece of advice that I've received is from one of my mentors and close friends, Dr. Rachel Ekarab. And she said, basically, if you're getting every position, you know, every job, every leadership role that you're applying for, then you're not reaching your full potential. You're not applying to enough. So we need to put ourselves out there and, you know, outside of medicine as well, you know, whether it's policy, research, politics, public health, what have you, and use those efforts that we've, you know, use our skills from medicine outside as well. So I've really taken that to heart and I feel like I follow that advice, you know, every day in terms of continuing to push myself oh, and that's beautiful. enhance new skills. Well, that's how you become regional vice president, I think, you know, applying to those positions. And I, I love that because you should be getting rejected because you should be applying to things that maybe you're not even ready for, but you have to challenge yourself. Exactly. You know? Thank you for that. Yeah, I, I have um, the one I, I really want to tell to residents is um, identify what level of participation they're offering you mm. uh, because it's going to be, it's going to change the way you engage and how you move forward. Um, if you identify a situation where all they want to do is give you information, then don't really expect to be able to give bi-directional feedback. Um, if you are seeing a consult, if you're being put in a position of consultation, um, then don't really expect to make part of the decision making at the end because mm -hmm. that's not the role you're playing. Uh, once you identify where you're at, you really can look at where you want to go. Mm -hmm. um, and this, this, there's this article written in 1969 by Sherry Arnstein. It's called The Ladder of Participation. It was m monumental for me when I first read it. And it really lays out uh, in a simplistic way on like the, la the rings of a ladder of how, the level of participation in one extreme to the other. Um, but identifying what level of participation you are being engaged with makes the difference on how you're going to then engage back. And then the one I remember from my own mentor, um, his name is R Ruben Martinez, the bookstore that I used to work in, uh -huh. MacArthur Grant winner. Um, and he said, Lorenzo, I either make the best decisions or the worst decisions, but nothing in between. And I was like, he's telling me, take a risk be bold. Sometimes you're going to fail and that's okay. But when you hit, it's going to be worth it. Uh, and, and that, that to me has always stayed with me. So just sometimes you just got to take that risk. I love it. I like I that a it. lot. Yeah. Lorenzo, Dana, thank you so much for joining us today. This was really useful for me because I feel like I, I had so much to learn. The organization, it seems to actually make a lot more sense. I will make sure that we put the links to the website in the description of our podcast. What are other ways that you want residents to get involved and what are other things we could share as resources for residents? If you're already uh, at a shop or a hospital, 
that is already organized by CIR, get to know your organizer, mm. right? Get to know them, talk to them, um, really and talk about what you care about so we can make that happen. Um, if you're currently not, um, you know, still reach out. We're on social media. We're continuously growing on social media. I think our Instagram is probably the most uh, accessible way. Um, we're at CIR SEIU all together, CIR SEIU. Uh, and, and really see what we're putting throughout the nation. Um, so right now you'll see a lot of what's happening in New York because they're currently um, in contract uh, negotiations. You'll start seeing what's happening in UCLA and the UC systems because they're in contract negotiations. And then sometimes you'll see the time we have folks out in the community uh, because community engagement is extremely important as well. So you'll be able to find us there, engage with us, and maybe we can strike up a conversation. That's great. And I just wanted to highlight that, you know, interns, residents, and fellows, they don't need a background in this to participate. You know, a lot of folks, it's their first time getting involved with anything related to advocacy, and that's great. We encourage that. So, you know, I do hear that, that, oh, you know, people are hesitant because they haven't done this before, and that's understandable, but, you know, we encourage folks who it's their first time, and there's a role for everyone, whether you want to be bargaining, writing the contract language, you know, working with the organizers, planning the events, doing graphic design, what have you, whatever your skills are. So there's there's a place for you. I hope that all the residents, all the fellows in, in this country that hear this, you know, that they get inspired. I can't tell you how much I appreciate the work you guys are doing. And we're in this together. And the fight continues. I'm just so grateful that there are there's residents who are working as hard as you are and fellows yeah. that are working equally as hard that are still trying to give back to the future residents and to make sure that their training is a better experience than we have it. And that's doing word. I think it'll continue that way. Uh, and I'm proud to serve any any type of role in that. Yeah, thanks for having us. This was awesome. It was, yeah, it was a lot of fun. Yes. There you have it, folks. I hope you guys left this one feeling meds fired. If you learned something new or if you genuinely enjoyed this episode, please don't forget to subscribe to our podcast and rate it five stars. Medspiration is a 501c3 nonprofit charity organization. The more you help us grow, the more people we're able to help. Let's make a commitment together, guys, and attempt to be the best possible version of ourselves, no matter what life throws at us, mentally, physically, and spiritually. As always, you know what time it is. It's time to get out there and to do something medspiring.